كلا إنها كلمة هو قائلها ومن ورائهم برزخ إلى يوم يبعثون إذا نفخ في الصور فلا أنساب بينهم فلا أنساب بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, Last lesson we had mentioned some of the issues of uh, passing away the blessings of passing away on Friday dying on Friday dying doing a good deed and some of the things that might protect us from the fitna and the adab al qabr and we're still talking about this ush- those issues of munkar and nakir and the issues of the fitna of the uh, qabr so let's finish off those issues i was hoping to finish last week but i wasn't able to do that before we move on to the next series of issues so let's begin today by asking the question that who will the fitna al qabr happen to will it happen to our ummah only or will it happen to all ummas because our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said this ummah shall be tested in the grave in hadhihi al ummah so does this mean that only this ummah and all the other ummas will not be tested so some of our scholars like al hakim at tirmidhi like ibn abd al bar they said this phrase means the previous ummas will not be tested and they reasoned as follows this is their reasoning they reasoned as follows they said the number one reason for the fitna to al-qabr remember there's fitna and adab don't get confused fitna is for muslim and kafir adab is for only the unrighteous fitna is for the generic people all of the people adab is for only the unrighteous so they said the primary reason for the fitna to al-qabr is to differentiate the mu'min from the munafiq. The fitna is meant to separate the mu'min from the munafiq. And the evidence goes back to the hadith of Munkar and nakir where the person says, Ah, ah, la adri. I heard the people saying, so I also said. Now, does the kafir say, Muhammad Rasulullah, does the kafir say dini al-islam no this is the munafiq that he is only following the crowd and he's not actually believing so some of our ulama said because there were really no munafiqun of previous ummas it seems to be a phenomenon of the prophet's time in our ummah so it will not be given to them and ibn al-qayyim and others they say the fitna of the qabr will be for all ummas including the previous ones and instead of being asked who is the prophet sallam they will be asked who is your prophet and they will have to respond in the end of the day it is a theoretical question allah knows best really there's no explicit evidence the same theoretical question is asked will children also have to do fitnat al qabr or not or the more technical term ghair mukallaf ghair mukallaf includes not only children Ghair Mukallaf means they are not obliged by Allah. They don't have legal obligations. Who is the Ghair Mukallaf? It's a number of categories. Number one is children. Number two, who else? The one who is mentally insane. This is Ghair Mukallaf, right? And others have added other categories. The point is these are called Ghair Mukallaf. Will there be fitna for the Ghair Mukallaf? And once again, you have our scholars... Yani this is what happens when you have encyclopedias that you write and you have to fill them with information. You have to go talk about the theoretical. In the end of the day, Allah knows best and it doesn't matter to us whether the Ghair Mukallaf will be or not be Zakallah Khair. We are just concerned about ourselves. So, in the end of the day, we are concerned about our own fitna. We don't know whether previous ummas will be asked or not. We don't know whether Ghair Mukallaf will be asked or not. Question, other than the Shaheed, whom we know there will be no fitna, right? Is there any way to protect ourselves from the fitna of the qabr? Is there any way to make sure we answer the question correctly? Is there, for lack of a better term, a cheat sheet? Okay? And by the way, these cheat sheets are halal if Allah has made them halal. There are certain things if you do them, you will be protected from this and that, right? Allah is giving us incentive. Do this, you'll be protective. Is there anything found in the tradition that will help us pass fitna to al-qabr? Some ulama have said, reciting Surah Al-Mulk 
is a mechanism to pass fitna to al-qabr right now this sounds really good and inshallah there's nothing wrong with reciting fitna to al-qabr but when you look at the hadith and you go back and you read the hadith it does not mention fitna to al-qabr it mentions adab al-qabr and therefore fitna does not come so what is the hadith but we're going to come back to this the hadith is in tirmidhi that uh, imam tirmidhi has the chapter heading what is the blessing of surat al-mulk then he has in it that uh, one day uh, the, the a man came uh, to the prophet sallam and said told him a story he said ya rasulullah i was outside traveling and i put a tent in the middle of the desert whatever and i didn't realize that the tent was on top of a qabr of somebody i didn't realize there was a qabr over there and i saw a human did he see with his eyes or did he see in a dream we don't know most likely in a dream went to sleep and i saw underneath me there was a human there was a, a insan yaqra'u surah tabarak alladhi biyadihi almulk until he finished the whole surah so he saw either a wakeful state or in a dream that the person beneath him is reciting surah mulk in its entire uh, you know uh, 30 ayat and so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said hi al mani'a hi al munjiya tunjihi min adhab al qabr it is the preventer surah mulk it is the savior surah mulk it shall save him from the adhab al qabr the hadith says what adhab al qabr now can you extrapolate and say okay the fitna is included and the response technically speaking adab is different than fitna and so there's nothing wrong with reading quran go ahead and read quran but we say there is nothing found in the text and allah knows best where we are told this will help us pass the fitna to al qabr allahumma accept one thing and that is to be sincere in our tawhid and our kalima and our ikhlas and our worship of allah and our following of the sunnah i e the only way to pass the test is to study for the exam there's no cheat sheet the only way to pass the fitna to al qabr is to actually live your life in accordance with islam to love the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to say rabbi allah and you mean it inna alladhina qalu rabbuna allah thumma istaqamu these are the people they will pass the fitna to al qabr with flying colors as for anyone else i have not found anything that is going to make fitna any easier everybody will be tested with the fitna okay so we are now done with the fitna aspect okay once again for those who are coming for the first time fitna is the examination it is done for the righteous and unrighteous and it is the three questions that munkar and nakir are going to ask uh, the people and the only people to be saved from the fitna explicitly are the shuhada and by qiyas we can say the very 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 righteous people obviously like the salihun sorry like the anbiya like the rusul obviously the rusul if the shaheed is not going to be fitna then the ones higher than the shaheed will be no fitna so there is no fitna for the prophets of allah there is no fitna for the rusul of allah and for the siddiq as well cuz the siddiq is higher than the shaheed and so there will be certain categories of people that they will be saved from the fitna but the default everyone even the righteous and the unrighteous will have the fitna okay we also mentioned munkar and nakir did we go over where we get the names from did i talk about that yes where do we get the names from hadith okay so i went over them hadith and tirmidhi okay did i go over the meanings of their names no we didn't go over that okay so munkar and nakir they come from the same root word which is basically yani nakara and nakara means in arabic it means to reject or to not know right so nakara is something that is strange and munkar in arabic yani is the opposite of ma'ruf right ya'muruna bil ma'ruf wa yanhawna 'anil munkar and ma'ruf urf that which we're accustomed to that which we like that which we appreciate munkar that which should be rejected that which we do not like now that's the technical definition of munkar linguistically nakara means to be unknown hence when you study arabic grammar you have ma'rifa and nakira nakira means that which is yani an unknown is ma'rifa is the specific that's the proper nakira is the unknown so munkar and nakir both 
go back to the same root they mean kind of the, they mean kind of the same thing and it means that which shall be rejected munkar that which is rejected nakir that which you don't recognize now why are these angels called munkar and nakir there's no explicit reason we have to try to derive it some ulama said that this is because most of mankind reject their existence so they're called munkar and nakir those whom we rejected no they are not rejectable they are real Others have said that their appearances will cause people to reject them. So when you see them, you don't like their appearances because they are the examiners. And even if you know your exam material, do you like taking exams? No. Even if you pass the exam and you are an A student, you still don't like sitting an exam. And you don't like the examiner coming and looking at your paper. You start sweating. Even if you're doing good and you're going to pass. When the examiner comes through, you don't like the examiner coming. So munkar and nakir. For the righteous and for the unrighteous, right? And this is a good, uh, in, a good interpretation. Imam al-Qurtubi has another interpretation. And remember I told you Imam al-Qurtubi has a three-volume book, which is one of the most detailed books ever written in medieval Islam about the journey of the soul and about the barzakh and about uh, Jannah and nar Imam al-Qurtubi said, the reason why they are called munkar and nakir is because their shakal, their manners and their looks are completely unique in the world of jinn and ins and angels. There's nothing like them. So they are unrecognizable as anything. So you reject them simply by seeing them, munkar and nakir. Even if you believe in them, their appearances are not positive. And you end up not accepting their appearances even if you're going to pass the test. In other words, it's very similar to what we just said. And therefore, Allah knows best, this seems to be a good interpretation. Why are they called munkar and nakir? Because nobody likes their presence even if you're going to pass. And looking at them, you want to not have them. That's munkar and nakir. Even if you, again, we said accept Allah and His Messenger, you don't like this test even if you pass it with flying colors. Jayid. So we talked about the issue of munkar and nakir and the fitnatul qabr. Okay, we now get to the issue of the na'imul qabr and adabul qabr. The issue of adab versus na'im. And again, for those of you that are coming for the first time, fitna is at the beginning. After the fitna, if you pass, you get na'im al-qabr. If you fail, you get adab al-qabr. Now, the issue of adab al-qabr is something that is mutawatir, that is mentioned in more ahadith than can be counted. And that is why it becomes an issue of theology. When we have so many narrations about a subject that the books of hadith are filled with it, our scholars of theology say, anybody who denies it has denied correct theology. So when you look at the classical treatises, the classical, the earliest books written about what do we believe, right? What does Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah believe? What is Sunni creed? You will find in it, and we believe in Adab al Qabr and Na'im al Qabr. And again, I mean, if we want to go over 15, 20, 15 different treatises written in the first four, five hundred years of Islam, little booklets, which are the classical first booklets ever written. What do we believe? Imam Ahmad wrote books and other great ulama wrote books. What do we believe? And we find in that list, Al-Tahawi has that creed. And Imam Al-Tahawi has in it, and we believe in Na'im Al-Qabr and Adab Al-Qabr. It becomes a part of our creed. Why is it a part of our creed? Because to end up rejecting this, you you have to end up rejecting dozens and dozens of a hadith found in Bukhari and Muslim and all of these books and that is a serious methodological problem. So belief in Na'im al-Qabr and Adab al-Qabr is a part of our creed. Did some groups reject it? Yes. Some of the Mu'tazila, not all of them, some of the Mu'tazila, they rejected Adab al-Qabr and Na'im al-Qabr and as usual they used their reason and logic and they said, what is Na'im al-Qabr and Adab al-Qabr before heaven and hell? Heaven and hell is where it all begins. That's where the Na'im and the Adab will begin. What's this interim that you will have some Na'im and some Adab doesn't make any sense. So because their minds couldn't understand Ilm al-Ghayb, they ended up rejecting it. And as I have said many, many times, if you listen to my talks carefully, when Allah says something explicitly, when the Prophet says something unequivocally, Sami'na wa ata'na. When they don't, then we can have room and leave. Adab al Qabr, Naim al Qabr is explicit. There is no room to reject it. So, 
we begin with one of the ahadith that is one of the most famous hadith of uh, Adab al Qabr, and that is Aisha radiallahu anha, Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim Mutafaq alayh. Aisha said, One day a Jewish beggar visited my door, knocked on the door, and I opened it. She had, you know, children, she begged me for food. So I gave her some tamra, some dates, and she made dua for me. And she said, May Allah protect you from Adab al Qabr. Aisha said, what is this Adab al-Qabr? There is no Adab al-Qabr. So she rejected the dua. I don't need this dua. We don't believe in Adab al That's your belief. We don't believe in it. By the way, this shows you it is allowed for a non-Muslim to make dua for a Muslim. You don't lose anything. She didn't reject the concept of dua. Anybody says, God bless you, say, Ma'am, God bless you too. I.e. with iman, no big deal. right? You can make dua for each other generically. And the non-Muslim is allowed. You don't have to make inkar if he says, God bless you, God is okay. So she made dua. May Allah protect you from Adab al-Qabr. Aisha said, there is no such thing as Adab al-Qabr. What are you talking about? Then she said, I waited for the Prophet to come. And she said, do you know what strange thing I heard today? This lady came of a Jewish background and she said may Allah protect us from Adab al-Qabr and I told her there is no Adab al-Qabr hadith is in Bukhari Muslim the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said O Aisha don't you know Allah has inspired me or in one version Uha ilayya I have been inspired meaning this isn't from my, my imagination this is from Allah Allah has given this wahi to me that we will be we meaning Yani the ummah or the people, mankind, that there is going to be adab al qabr. In the ummati or my ummah, they will have adab al qabr. And then Aisha said, every salah that he would say, sallallahu alayhi wa I would hear him say, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min adab al qabr. Now, did he start saying this after this incident, or did Aisha begin to notice after this incident? Either one is possible. But the point is, he would always seek isti'adah from Adab al-Qabr. And another famous hadith about Adab al-Qabr, which is one we should know, uh, Sunan al-Tirmidhi, Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu an, his famous student narrated this. And he said, when we visited uh, Baqi' uh, Uthman would always cry. Every time we visited the graveyard, he would cry so much so that his beard would have his tears in it. His beard would have his tears in it. So one day I said to him that... Why is it that when Jannah and Nar is recited in the Quran, when you know other things happen, you don't have this level of reaction as you do when you visit the Qabr? Why is it that when heaven and hell are mentioned, this isn't always the case? By the way, it wasn't always, but it was sometimes the case. Uthman radiallahu anhu, we know him to be somebody with a gentle heart. We know him that he was very commonly be crying when he read the Quran. But his student is saying that you seem to be more impacted by the qabr than by other things. So he said, I heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, the qabr is the first station out of all of the stations of the Akhirah. In the Qabr, awwalu manzilin min manazil al Akhirah. There's going to be many manazil you go through. And the first is the Qabr. So whoever is saved in the Qabr, saved. So there is going to be punishment then. Whoever is saved in the Qabr will find the rest of the journey easy. And whoever is not saved in the Qabr will find the rest of the journey difficult. So we have an explicit hadith again To be saved from the punishment The rest will be easy To not be saved The rest will be worse And in the hadith of Imam Majah The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said I have seen nothing in my life Except that the qabr is more terrifying Than what I have seen And what has he seen? He has been to the heavens and back He has seen the punishments of Jahannam He has seen everything He said, I have seen nothing Except that the qabr is more terrifying than it This is our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying So there is something called Adab al-Qabr As we said Now, there are certain things that come under Adab Yet they don't come under Adab Let me explain Certain things will happen They're a type of punishment But Maybe even some of the righteous will undergo them 
and it's not quite therefore under the category of adab, even if it is a type of punishment. Does that make sense? We talked about the fitna, that's a separate category. There's another thing called the dhammatul qabr, and this is mentioned in the hadith. The dhammatul qabr, the dhammatul qabr is a squeezing that will take place, that will surround the body. Now, the dhammatul qabr, when will it take place? Before or after the fitna? We do not know. We do not know. Some have said before the fitna to al-qabr, some have said after the fitna to al-qabr. But there will be something called the dhamma. And the dhamma or the squeezing, it will be without exception for all of mankind, including the shaheed. So, the squeezing will be a universal incident that all mankind has to pass over. No one will be safe from it. But as for the believer, the squeezing will be gentle and let go. And as for other than that, then the squeezing will be very tight and it will be a punishment and not let go. How do we know this? We know this from the very terrifying hadith. We should really pay attention to this and benefit from it. The hadith of Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. Who is Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh? Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh is the leader of the Ansar. Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh is the one whom uh, judged between the Prophet and the Banu Quraidah after the incident of the, the uh, uh, Khandaq. Remember the treachery that took place? Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, that is that one. He was sick in the masjid, bleeding in the masjid of the Prophet and he came on the, uh, uh, the donkey, carried on the donkey and then he did the arbitration between the Prophet on one side and the Banu Qaridah on the other. They both chose Sa'ad to arbitrate between them. What a honor that he had. And when he gave the verdict, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, this is the verdict that Allah wanted from above the seven heavens. Do you or you are correct in your verdict. So when they went to bury Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh and pretty much the whole city of Medina and all the Ansar came, this was their leader, one of the largest janazas in the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ, uh, was Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, that when they did the janazah and they buried him and the ground was covered up, the Prophet ﷺ said, Subhanallah, Allahu Akbar. And he wasn't typically who would say this after the burial. When he said this, Subhanallah, the Sahaba are so much wanting to follow what the Prophet ﷺ did. When he said this, the whole crowd, Subhanallah, Wallahu Akbar, Subhanallah, Wallahu Akbar. Yani the whole city of Medina is now, simply because the Prophet ﷺ did it once, the whole crowd is now following. This shows us the love that they had for our Prophet ﷺ. Then when the crowd quieted, one of them said, Ya Rasulullah, why did you say subhanallah wallahu akbar? Because you didn't, don't typically do this after the janazah, right? This also shows us not only their love, but their curiosity, their eagerness for knowledge. They are monitoring each and everything that the Prophet is doing. And they are wanting to know, what, why did you do this, Ya Rasulullah? So one of them says, why did you say subhanallah wallahu akbar? So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that had rajul, he pointed to the qabr. Hadha rajul. This man, Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, the one whom ihtazza al-arsh, Allah's throne shook when he was died, when he was killed. Yani Allah's throne shook that how dare somebody kills the, you know, in the battle of the Khandaq, he was killed. So when he died, the Prophet said, Allah's throne shook at his death. The one whom Allah's throne shook for. And futtihat lahu sama and the skies of the heavens opened up. And 70,000 angels made shafa'a for him. This person, right now, laqad dhumma dhumma. He felt the squeeze. That's why I said, subhanallah, Allahu Akbar. Laqad dhumma dhammatan. He felt the squeeze. And then, thumma nujya. Then it was released for him. And he said, if anyone were to have been saved, it would have been Sa'd ibn Mu'adh. Which means who is saved? No one. That's why the Prophet was in a type of like surprise. Subhanallah, Allahu Akbar. Even Sa'd, that was why he said Subhanallah, Allahu Akbar. So he said, this man, the one whom Allah's throne shook for, and the sky is opened up for 70,000 angels came to, to attend his janazah and make shafa'a. This man, his qabr squeezed him. And if anybody would have been squeezed, I thought it would have been him. But he wasn't. 
But then, what was it? Furrija'an unujja. Then he was released from that. So, this shows us that the dhamma of the qabr, it is a one-off, a quick squeezing for the righteous. It happens and you let go of it. Even the righteous will undergo it. But as for the righteous, it's like the issues of this dunya, the pain and suffering. Everybody has a fever. Everybody yani, goes through pain and suffering. It's one of the inevitable rites of passage of the qabr. No one will be saved from it. It will happen. But as for the righteous, it will be a light squeezing and then let go. There's going to be just a clamping as soon as the body is put in. Now, some have said, by the way, and I, I, I like this, but Allah knows best. Some have said the fact that the Prophet said this, when they just finished burying, indicates the dhamma is before the fitna. Right? And this actually makes sense if you think about it. Because when the qabr, when the body is put in, and you put the, the, the sand on it, then the first thing is the qabr, essentially, is this is the welcoming of the qabr. Welcome to your new world. It is the welcoming. Then munkar and nakir come. So Allah knows best. You can make this argument from this hadith. Why? Because the Prophet is not even moving from his place as soon as the sand is leveled over. Even though when he made dua for the other deceased, when the hadith, the long hadith of Al-Bara bin Azib, he stood for a long time making dua. And he said, ask Allah for thabat because your sahib, your companion is being asked right now. Right now came maybe 5-10 minutes after the qabr is finished being done, right? Whereas in the hadith of Sa'ad, he hadn't even moved. And he says, لَقَدْ ضُمَّ ضَمَّةً So Allah knows best. And even psychologically or whatever you want to say, يعني, it makes sense that the dhumma or the dhamma, both are allowed in Arabic, dhumma and dhamma just depends on the context, is before the fitna of the qabr. And Allah knows best. Now, after that, there is another issue. Whether it's again after the fitna looks like uh, So the dhamma, the fitna Now we have the next issue And that is the darkness or the lightness of the grave The grave will either be dark or light right? So the grave is either tight or vast This is one aspect right? And then the grave is either dark or light That is another aspect Okay, and these are also mentioned in the uh, hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And of them, the hadith of Bukhari and Muslim, the famous hadith, all of you know, uh, that there was a lady who would clean the masjid in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. One day, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi noticed she's not there anymore, so he asked about her. They said, "Ya Rasulullah, she died at night." We didn't want to disturb you. We just prayed a quick janazah and buried her before Fajr. You know, and by the way, this shows it is allowed to bury somebody at night, even though the madhahib typically say that you should wait until the daytime simply because you want to get a larger group of people. There, there's nothing wrong with burying somebody at night, but just yani, you want to, the news to spread. People come and pray, you know, uh, Fajr or Dhuhr, there's a larger crowd rather than yani, the night and, and 2 a.m. who's going to come. But technically, it is allowed to bury somebody at night, no problem. So she was buried buried at night and so the Prophet said show me where is her qabr so they went to Baqir and showed this is where she is buried so he then salla alayha does, what does it mean salla alayha most likely it means he made dua for her because salla also means dua he made dua for her then he said inna hadhihi al-qubur zulmatun mali'atun ala ahliha these qubur they are dark and dank, dark and tight, dark and squeezed for its people, which means the default of the qabr is that it is dark and dank because the default of mankind is kufr. So the default of the qabr is that it is dark and it is not a hospitable place. And subhanallah, even in our dunya on the top side of the qabr, in every culture and society, the qabr is an abandoned and dark place. Is something just society wise it has nothing to do with religion the qabr is the abandoned place the cemetery is not the place where is just the, the place you leave it it's abandoned and dark and what not in every culture and society as if what is happening there is reflected on what is happening on top so the Prophet said these qubur and the key word zulmatun they are dark and they are tight upon his people and Allah Azza wa Jal will give light through my salah to her. 
Right? What a lucky lady she is. What a fortunate lady she is that the Prophet ﷺ made dua so her qabr became light. What does this show? Some qabrs will be dark and some qabrs will be light. And this shows that obviously there are ways to make the qabr enlightened. And of those ways is the dua of the Prophet ﷺ. And of those ways, why did the Prophet ﷺ make dua for her? Maintaining the masjid. This is the direct cause, direct cause of the Prophet ﷺ walking from the masjid to Baqir to show that honor to somebody who maintained the masjid. So, taking care of the masajid, donating to the masajid. And this lady, she didn't have any money. But what did she do? She cleaned the masjid. That's all that she did. She didn't write a check for anything. She didn't have it. She simply maintained the ambience of the masjid. And because of that, the only sahabi that we know of, that the Prophet ﷺ walked to make a special dua for in the qabr and then walked back, is this lady over here. And in fact, we don't even know her name. Because people did not record it, but Allah Azza wa Jal recorded it, and the Prophet gave her the haq. So this shows us that that from this we can extrapolate. From this we can extrapolate that certain good deeds bring about the nur in the qabr. Because in her case, she took care of the masjid. And directly the Prophet made dua for her in this case. Now we have another very interesting hadith that also indicates that there are levels of, of, of nur in the uh, qabr. And of them is a hadith in Ibn Majah in which the Prophet وسلم, said, إِذَا وُضِعَ الْمَيِّتُ فِي الْقَبْرِ When the deceased is put in the qabr, مُثِّلَ لَهُ he is made to sense or thinks that the sun is about to set. So when the mayyit is put in the qabr, he gets a sense that it is about to become dark, but it's not quite dark. And so he tries to get up and he says, let me pray, let me pray. This is a very interesting hadith in Sunan Ibn Majah. It is authentic. And from this, we can derive that the righteous person is not in utter darkness. Rather, there is an ambience of light. Because when the sun is about to set, it is not dark. There is an ambience of light. It's not shining bright, neither is it dark. It's enough for you to see and feel comfortable. So the, the, the mayyit, muthila lahu means it is made to appear to him. Because obviously there is no sunrise and sunset, right? It's not, but it is as if the sun is about to set. He kind of gets the sense that Asr time is finishing. So he is not fully, maybe the first day or something, he's not fully aware that he's dead maybe. So he's getting up. Because the Prophet said he gets up and he says, let me pray, let me pray. Which shows this is for the righteous. This is the one who used to pray Asr regularly. This is the mu'min, the muttaqi. He's praying his five prayers regularly. So when he's put in the qabr, the Prophet is saying, the ambience is light. It's not dark there. So this also shows us therefore that the qabr will have levels of light. And that again, from the general text of the Quran and Sunnah, we can extrapolate the level of lightness will depend upon the, right, the state of righteousness that is there. Now, this also leads us to another interesting question. The man is trying to get up and say that I want to pray, I want to pray. Is there salah in the barzakh? Is there salah in the barzakh? Well, what we do know is that the Prophet ﷺ told us that the prophets of Allah are praying in their qabr. This is something that is found in a number of traditions. Actually, even in Bukhari and other books. The Prophet ﷺ said, I passed by Musa, the night of Isra wal Mi'raj. And he described how Musa looked and he said, فَإِذَا هُوَ قَائِمٌ يُصَلِّي فِي قَبْرِهِ He was standing praying in his qabr. I passed by Isa, I passed by so and so, and they were praying, standing and praying. So this indicates that the prophets are in salah. Now, what does this mean? And again, all of these are theoretical, Allah knows. al qadi Iyad, who was one of the greatest scholars of Andalus, and he wrote many books about uh, uh, the seerah, and uh, one of the most famous books ever written about the blessings of the Prophet ﷺ is Qadi Iyad, Ashifa fi 
Hukuq al Mustafa. This is one of the most famous and the most blessed books ever written about the blessings of our Prophet. Al Qadi Iyaz Shifa, it's called, and it has actually been translated to English. You should uh, have a copy of it and read it. So, Al Qadi Iyaz writes about this in this narration, and he says, Well, it can't really be Salah Salah. It's not Salah because there is no Salah in the Barzakh. Salah is something the Mukallafin do. So he said, Salah here means dhikr and dua. Because there will be dhikr and dua in the qabr. Dhikr and dua is in every state. On qiyamah, dhikr and dua is then you make dua to Allah throughout. No, uh, you know, no time. Because we know this from the other hadith. Even the believer will make dua to Allah in the qabr. What will the dua be? Oh Allah, hasten judgment day. And the kafir will make the opposite. Oh Allah, delay. So this is an ibadah. It is taking place. It is dua. So Al Qadi Iyad said, This is salah that no, is not salah, it is dua and dhikr. Al Qurtubi says, No, this is an actual salah. They are praying salah. And Ibn Hajar and others, they say, Perhaps he, he brings a qawl, he doesn't endorse it himself. He says, Some have said, Some have said that when the Prophet is passing by and he sees Musa standing and praying, he is actually seeing Musa when he used to pray in this world. Because in the Barzakh, time is all the same. So it's another dimension. So the Prophet is not seeing Musa in the Barzakh. He is seeing the semblance of Musa when Musa used to pray. How did he pray? Then he is seeing him here. But the response is that the hadith is explicit. مَرَرْتُ بِقَبْرِ Musa. I passed by the qabr of Musa. فَإِذَا هُوَ قَائِمٌ يُصَلِّي Lo and behold, he was standing in salah. Al-Qurtubi says, and I like this, this is a good interpretation. Al-Qurtubi says, if somebody were to say, how come the prophets are praying and Barzakh is not the land of taklif? Barzakh is not where you're supposed to pray and fast and do tahajjud and what not. Al-Qurtubi says the response is as follows. In this world, the prophets felt the most peace in salah. جُعِلَتْ قُرَّةُ عَيْنِي فِي الصَّلَاةِ And they felt the closest to Allah in salah. And so in the barzakh, Allah will gift them to feel that closeness as a gift, takrima for them to pray. It's not an act of ibadah that they must pray Fajr, Duhar, Asr, Maghrib, Isha. No. It's not mukallaf salah. It is a salah of enjoyment. It is a salah they will feel peaceful praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is a good response. That it's not a salah of ibadah because there is no ibadah in the barzakh. The barzakh is gone. Uh, sorry, the ibadah is gone. But the prophets of Allah will be allowed to pray. Now, does this mean that others will pray? And the response is there is not a shred of evidence that any other category will pray other than the prophets. Even the shaheed, we don't have any evidence he's going to be praying. So Allah knows best. This is an exception for the prophets of Allah that Allah will bless them to pray. As for the rest of the, the people, there will be no, there will be no uh, um, uh, salah or any act of worship. Now, the issue of the na'im al-qabr, the issue of the, uh, the, 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 the blessings of the qabr. Looking at all of the hadith, and we'll finish with this, and inshallah, next class we'll talk about the adab al-qabr. So we'll start with the adab in the next, uh, next Wednesday, inshallah. The issue of na'im al-qabr. If you look at the na'im al-qabr and what is mentioned about na'im al-qabr, the fact of the matter is that we don't really have too much mentioned about na'im. We do not have too much mentioned about na'im. In fact, all that I mentioned in the last two or three lectures, this is all that we have. To summarize, of them, of the na'im al-qabr, is that Allah will allow him to pass the exam. That the qabr will be made wide. That the qabr will be made light. That the smell of Jannah, the fragrance of Jannah will be given to him. That the good deeds will come and will calm him down. That he will be shown his place in Jannah and he will say, Oh Allah, hasten judgment day. And he will be shown his place in Jahannam and he will thank Allah that he would have gone to if he wasn't righteous. And he will thank Allah that he is not going there. And that's about it. There is nothing extra mentioned about this. And in fact, there is one narration that really is very, very deep and profound. 
And there's, as far as I have come across, only one narration, and it is authentic. It is authentic. So we base our aqidah on it. It is in Sunan at Tirmidhi. And this narration seems to indicate that the righteous person, once they enter the grave, and the grave is made vast and light and fragrance, and they see Jannah and whatnot, they will essentially enter a trance. And they'll just live in that trance until Qiyamah. So it's not as if, and this actually makes sense to be honest, it's not as if they're living a separate life of the Barzakh. It's rather that they enter it and they are at peace. They calm down. They see their place in Jannah. They see Allah has saved them. The Qabr becomes a decent and a dignified place. And then they enter that trance. And this trance has been called the sleep of the Qabr. And where do we learn this from? From a hadith in Tirmidhi. That the Prophet ﷺ said after Munkar and Nakir for the righteous person, ثُمَّ يُفْسَحُ لَهُ فِي قَبْرِهِ سَبْعُونَ ذِرَاعًا فِي سَبْعِينَ Then the Qabr will be made vast for him. 70 cubits by 70 cubits. The fact that a measurement comes clearly indicates that there will be different levels for different people. So of the highest level, because we're talking about now the highest level, his Qabr will be 70 feet by 70 feet, a massive room. Our rooms and our houses are 12 feet by 12 feet. And that's what we live in, right? The Qabr is saying 70 feet by 70 feet. This is a clear indication that it will be different sizes. The greatest righteous man will be 70 by 70 and then there will be smaller and small. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, ثُمَّ يُنَوَّرُ لَهُ فِي So, light will come to him. So, as we said, the Fushatul al-Qabr and the Nur al-Qabr will come for the righteous. ثُمَّ يَقُولُ لَهُ Nim. He will then be told, go to sleep. Now, sleep and awake are something we associate in this dunya. And in the barzakh, the ruh and the body are not directly connected. So what is the gnome of the qabr? Allahu a'lam. But it is, we'll call it in English, a trance. You are put in a different state of mind. The man will say, let me go back to my family so I can tell them everything is good and fine. This indicates that the man has now realized he's dead. That the man is now fully aware that, okay, this is it now. Now everything is good. Alhamdulillah, I'm at peace. I know my family is still terrified. I know my family is worried. He will say, let me go back for a good reason, nothing for a bad. And the angels will say, Go to sleep. The sleep of a bride. The sleep of, uh, actually a groom here. Al-Arus is the groom here. The sleep of a groom. That, basically, the symbolism is being given that on the wedding night, yani after the wedding night, mashallah, tabarakallah, dot, 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 then you go to sleep, mashallah, tabarakallah, right? That is a deep sleep. So then the angels say, go to sleep, the sleep of that groom who knows that the next morning his beloved will wake him up, right? That peaceful sleep of the night of the wedding, after the wedding, Allahul Musta'an, yani, what happens, happens, right? But that night of the wedding, we have that peaceful sleep. This is in the hadith, by the way, that نَوْمَةَ الْعَرُوسِ الَّذِي لَا يُقِضُهُ إِلَّا أَحَبُّ أَهْلِي إِلَيْهِ Go to sleep. That sleep that you know now that the next morning who's going to wake me up? The most beloved person in the world is going to wake me up. That gentle waking up that will happen the next morning. You can look forward to that. Now the angels say to him, go to sleep, that type of sleep. Now what is this sleep? Allahu A'lam, we don't know what it is. It's the alam al-barzakh. But we can understand what it is. It is a type of trance. You just go and you freeze up basically a peaceful sleep and you look forward to being woken up it's not a terror it's not an adab you are now in a limbo state and you will remain that way until the resurrection and the final point and then we open the floor for Q&A and this is in fact proven in the Quran قَالُوا يَا وَيْلَنَا مَنْ بَعَثَنَا مِنْ مَرْقَدِنَا they will say Waylana here doesn't necessarily mean adab. So, oh my God, what's happening? This is also wail. What's going on here? There's a state of discomfort. 
قالوا يا ويلنا من بعثنا من مرقدنا who has brought us back from our place of sleep مرقد in Arabic is اسم مكان is a noun proper noun for the place where you sleep or more technically where you go take a nap this is marqad this is literally what marqad means where you take a nap the qaylula the siesta because you know you go to sleep in in some cultures you would have an inner private bedroom then you would have just a place outside where you just sleep for a while that's the marqad over there and this indicates what were the people of the barzakh asleep asleep the sleep of the barzakh that's what this hadith proves now who is this given to it is given to the righteous person as for the unrighteous we seek allah's refuge they will not go to sleep they will not be in because sleep is bliss sleep you just are in you forget the worries of this world and even in the barzakh as for the unrighteous we ask allah's refuge there is no sleep for them what is it adab and we will talk about the types of adab and the categories of adab and the main causes of adab we'll talk about that inshallah next wednesday with that we open the floor for a few minutes of q and a inshallah then we call it a day bismillah yes so the brother is saying isn't there a dua that oh allah make my qabr uh, one of the gardens of paradise and do not make my qabr uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, places of jahannam and as far as i'm aware i will confirm with uh, with uh, with you next week as far as i'm aware and if i'm mistaken then i will correct this on camera this is not a hadith of the prophet sallallahu it is a common dua that is done so there's nothing wrong with the meaning of this uh, but it's not as far as i'm aware and i will check inshallah and confirm by next week inshallah yes go ahead in the qabr so the brother says that the good deeds come to the person in the form of a calming and soothing presence and this is true we mentioned this two three weeks ago that the prophet said when he passes munkar and Nikki's test this is after that a man will come that whose face is the face of bashara good news in other words, you know when some people come and you see serenity and peace, you see this is a person that he is coming, he's happy and whatnot. So the man will say, welcome, marhaban, who are you? Your presence is bringing me calmness and whatnot. So that entity will say, and this is Allah's blessings that he has made this happen. I am your good deeds. I am your good deeds. So the good deeds will take on the symbolic form of an actual human. Now the brother said, will this entity stay with us or not? From the hadith, it seems that it's just a one-off thing. That the entity will come and basically cheer us up. Or the opposite to those who have evil deeds. That it is simply of the beginning of the long journey. That the first welcomer that will come will be your good deeds or your evil deeds and then after that the rest will happen and Allah knows best sisters any questions yes go ahead we will talk about this inshallah the, the question is the good deeds that come will we see them in the qabr or from judgment day we'll talk about this the relationship between the dead and the living no questions right now we didn't even start that topic i will give inshallah inshallah one of the most detailed lectures inshallah ta'ala you have ever heard because this is a very interesting topic i'm interested in it i've done research on this and everybody wants to know we'll go into a lot of detail good deeds transferring of good deeds can the dead hear all of these inshallah you're in the right class but not right now we're still in the na'im and adab other things yes go ahead yes go ahead both of you together ya allah bismillah could you comment on these two ayat that the Uh, 
So the brother asks about two verses of the Quran. Uh, in fact, we did go over them in the very first lecture, and I'll go over them again. You thabbitu Allahu ladina amanu bil qawli thabiti fil hayat dunya wa fil akhirah. Allah will make firm with the firm speech. You thabbitu Allahu ladina amanu bil qawli thabit. Those that are believers, Allah will make firm for them with the firm speech in this world and in the next world. Ibn Abbas said. Allah will bless the mu'min to say La ilaha illallah at the time of death and Allah will then allow the mu'min to respond to munkar and nakir in the qabr. This is one interpretation which is inshallah the most obvious one. يُثَبِّتُ اللَّهُ لِذِ آمَنُوا فِي الْقَوْلِ الثَّابِتِ Allah will affirm the believer بِالْقَوْلِ الثَّابِتِ is La ilaha illallah. Right? In this world, meaning at the time of death. And in the next world, meaning in the barzakh. As for the next verse, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَ اللَّهُ ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُوا تَتَنَزَّلُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ أَلَّا تَخَافُ وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا This is mentioned in the hadith of Barak bin Azib, explicitly. Our Prophet ﷺ made tafsir of this ayah. Our Prophet ﷺ told us what this ayah means. And it means that those who are righteous, Allah will send angels down. تَتَنَزَّل means in batches and batches. Not nazala, not, no, tatanazzal. They are coming down, coming down. And our Prophet system explained, as far as the eye can see, there are angels. Tatanazzal. As far as the eye can see. And their faces are calming faces, bright faces. Bayadul wujuh. As far as the eye can see. They have the perfumes of Jannah, the shrouds of Jannah. And when they take the ruh out, they will say, Allah takhafu. Don't be worried about yourself. Wala tahzanu. Don't be grieved about your family that you're leaving behind. Khauf is for yourself. Huzun for somebody else. You know? Everyone will be worried. Who's gonna take care of my kids? What's gonna happen with my wife? Everything. The angels will say, Don't worry. We will take care of them. Nahnu awliya'ukum fil hayatu dunya wa We took care of you when you were alive. We will take care of you now that you're with us. We'll take care of them in the next world. So the Prophet explained this ayah. Yes, go ahead. So the brother says that the righteous people will not have adab al-qabr. Yet all of us, we have some sins and so we're struggling between piety and sin. Does this mean that we will be saved from adab al-qabr because we are believers? The response is, the believer is always between two emotions. Hope of forgiveness and fear of punishment. It is a sign of iman. It is a sign of iman to be optimistic, inshallah, I won't have adab al-qabr. At the same time, to be scared, what if I have adab al-qabr? This is iman. Iman, your whole life is lived between these two emotions. You are always hopeful, inshallah, Allah will give me jannah. But then you're scared, what if I don't get jannah? Oh, Allah protect me from jannah. This is the, the, the emotion that all of us should have between the optimism and fear. It's called khawf and raja. Sisters, any questions before you? Yes, go ahead. Are we allowed to plant the tree on the graves of people? So, uh, As-Suyulti, the famous scholar of Mamluk, Egypt, died 911. You will always remember that date, 911. That's the year he died. Uh, Suyulti died 911, Hijra, not CE. As-Suyulti, uh, one of the greatest scholars of Egypt of his time, and the student of the student of Hafid ibn Hajar. Uh, actually, he met Ibn Hajar. Uh, As-Suyuti wrote a treatise on this Adab al-Qabr issue, and he mentions in it that because the Prophet ﷺ planted a stalk, we too should plant stalks. So he did that. However, other Shafi'i scholars, he was a Shafi'i scholar, and other scholars of the madhabs, they generally uh, disagreed with this reasoning. And they said, that, and we're going to come to this hadith next week actually, that the Prophet ﷺ passed by a qabr and he put a leaf or a stalk in it. And he said, these people are being punished for whatever thing, we'll talk about that next week. And Allah will lift their punishment or make it less as long as these two stalks are still wet. Okay, so based on this, Asuyuti said, well in that case we should put stalks in all of the qabrs and whatnot. But the response I think anybody knows. 
Is this something that the Prophet ﷺ did for the rest of us to do or is this something khas and unique that Allah blessed him? Obviously, one of us to do it. <laughs> what, what good will that do compared to the Prophet ﷺ, right? So the issue comes here with respect to this great scholar of Islam. If this had been something that would have eliminated Adab al-Qabr, the Sahaba would have gone around every Qabr doing it themselves. And the Tabi'un would have done it to the Sahaba's Qabr. And this would have been something that the Ummah is doing to all the Qubur. But that context says, how did the Prophet even know? I mean, how, sorry, how would any one of us know? We would not know. The Prophet knew, Jibreel or whatever told him. Even if we know somehow, will my sticking a rose or uh, something actually help? Obviously not. So the Prophet's maqam is so high, he is making shafa'i, saying, as long as these are, are, are still moist, inshallah ta'ala, they will remain uh, without being punished. You know? So this is the point, inshallah. Uh, yes, go ahead. Uh, does the adab al-qabr uh, compensate for the adab of judgment day so there were, are two categories of people we'll mention this in more detail next week there's two categories of people the first of them those that are destined to go to jahannam they will enter jahannam those people the adab al-qabr is a prelude it is a teaser to adab of jahannam in other words they will be punished in the barzakh and then they will be punished even worse in the in the fire of hell so for them the adab al-qabr is actually just a teaser and this is actually explicit in the quran we'll talk about this next week that وَإِنَّ لِلَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا عَذَابًا دُونَ ذَلِكَ وَلَكِنَّ أَكْثَرَهُمْ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ the people who do, do shirk uh, Allah mentions the fire of hell then he says and the people who do this shirk, they will have a punishment that is lesser than that punishment as well. But most people don't know. Now this is a really interesting verse. The people of Jahannam, sorry, the people of shirk will go to Jahannam. Then Allah says, but they will have a punishment duna dhalik, lesser than that as well. What is this punishment? It is mentioned in the Quran, we'll talk about this next week as well, that وَحَاقَ بِآلِ فِرْعَنُ سُوءَ الْعَذَابِ uh, that the family of Fir'aun will be punished severely. And the Fir'aun people, the people of Fir'aun, the family of Fir'aun will be punished severely. How? The fire will be shown to them morning and evening. Shown. Shown to them. يُعْرَضُون. They will be shown the fire of hell. Then on judgment day it will be said enter that fire so what is this verse this is adab al qabr then it is the actual jahannam now this is the worst category we seek as refuge there will be a category that our scholars have derived from the generality of the texts and these are the fasaqa of the mu'minin these are the fasaqa of the mu'minin the evil people of the mu'minin so they are not muttaqeen. They are not salihin because they have no adab al-qabr. They are those who are committing sins amongst the believers, major sins amongst the believers, and they have not repented. These people, they might be punished in the qabr, and they think they will be punished in jahannam. And their thinking they're punished in jahannam is itself a punishment, but on judgment day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive them. And I've just given you 10 minutes of next Wednesday's lecture. This was all for next uh, Wednesday. We'll go into more detail inshallah next Wednesday. I'll repeat all of this all over again for the lecture. And with that inshallah we conclude. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. لا يزال الخير حيا لا يزال إن في الدنيا سلاما واضلال أخبر الأيام أنها في وصال قم بنا وانظر لآيات الجمال قم بنا وانظر لآيات الجمال